We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and my guest today is John Paler, who is an award-winning blogger and mental health advocate and the author of The War Inside of Me about his battle with being bipolar. He's also a husband and a father. I've invited him on the program not just so I can learn more about being bipolar, but because I suspect that we could all learn something from his daily plan which stops his mental health from being compromised. When I've come across bipolar, they have often had a diagnosis in the wake of infidelity, as bipolar can include impulsivity, acting without thinking about the consequences, hypersexuality and suicide attempts. There's a lot of fear and prejudice about being bipolar, and I'd also like to help combat the stigma. So, John, welcome to The Meaningful Life. Yeah, thanks for having me, Andrew. I really appreciate it. (laughs) So let's go right to basics. What is bipolar? Well, I have bipolar disorder type 1. There's four different types, but the main one is type 1, which is characterized by extreme mood swings, mania, and depression. And I get severe mania and I get severe depression. The thing I think people don't realize, it is a mood disorder. So it's not just throughout the day, oh, I get real happy and then I get real sad. The episodes last days, weeks, sometimes months. I had one that lasted over a year. Gosh. So it's actually episodic. I think people just think, oh, you're moody throughout the day. Oh, you must be bipolar. But it's more than that. It's more complicated. And not only is it characterized by these mood swings, but energy level is affected. Because if you think about it with mania, you're amped up, you're so revved up. So your energy is going to be really high. And then when you get depressed, your energy level just tanks and sinks. So your energy levels are fluctuating as well. And then that impacts your motivation and finally your functionality and how you're able to function from day to day. So like I said, I have type one, there's also type two and there's cyclothymic disorder and then not otherwise specified. Those are not as common as one and two though. So Let's just clear up the differences between them. Bipolar 2 is generally considered to be a milder version of bipolar 1. Have I got that correct? Right. And it's characterized mainly, there's still depression and there's still highs, but it's hypomania, which is a lesser degree of mania. But the thing is, uh, that's another misconception. People think, oh, well, bipolar type 2, since it has hypomania, you know, it's not as severe or, you know, doesn't affect you as much. But the reality is just based on symptoms. It's still just as hard to deal with. It's just a different type because type one, you're more into the mania, the up side of things. And type two, it's more characterized the people that have it in the depression more so, generally speaking. And what exactly is cyclothermic disorder then? Cyclothermic is just... It's an even lesser form of depression and it's still about hypomania. It's, and it's fluctuates more so and it's the actual symptoms are less. So I think it's actually quite helpful to think of this as a continuum really rather than separate issues. Yeah. Uh, Am I right with that? Yeah, definitely, Andrew, because I actually think of it as more like a bipolar spectrum. If you look at it in terms of the severity of symptoms where you have you know, type one here and then two, and then you go down to cyclothymic disorder. Yeah, that's a good way. That's how I look at it. So looking back, when do you think the clues were there that you had uh, bipolar one? Well, I was diagnosed right before my 21st birthday. I went to college here up in Fort Collins, Colorado. But if I look back even before then, I can see actual characteristics of bipolar disorder way back to when I can remember when I was younger. But it really came to the surface when I was at college 
with severe stress. I think now the consensus is that you're more genetically predisposed for it. And then a big traumatic or stressful event happens, which for me was going to college. I was away for my first time from home. And that's when I got manic and I had psychosis and delusions and everything just kind of fell apart at that point. So walk us through what what happened so we can get an insight. You know, you were talking about infidelity at the very beginning. And when it comes to mania, impulsivity is huge. And when I say impulsivity, it's not just like, oh, I want to do that. I do it. It's the fact like, oh, this seems right. This is okay to me. And I'm just going to do it because I have the energy and you don't think of the consequences at all. And so at the time I was engaged and I kind of was sleeping around a little bit. And then, you know, I was out partying. I was staying up at all hours of the night. And, you know, a lot of people were just saying, oh, you're in college. That's normal. But then I started to see things and hear things that weren't there. And it just got to the point where I couldn't function. I actually had to withdraw from school. Those first few years after I was diagnosed, I was in and out of the hospital. They were trying to find meds that would allow me to function at an even keel because it's so chaotic in your head. I just spoke with my buddy the other day who was in college with me. And I I asked him because I don't really remember a lot of what happened. And he said, oh man, John, we could tell when you were manic because you'd be talking and you'd go off on tangents on all these subjects and your eyes would be going all around and you couldn't focus and you were so revved up and you would never sleep. You'd just run and work out and lift weights. And you were just like the life of the party. You had endless amounts of energy. And it sounds awesome, but our body isn't made that way. I mean, it's, you can't, you can't maintain that sort of intensity over a long period of time. So. And I imagine when you're in that phase and somebody tries to say to you, John, I think you need help. You are not going to listen. It's so interesting you say that, Andrew, because I was just talking to somebody about psychosis and me going through that. And it's not something you can talk someone out of. You can't say, well, John, you're not friends with the Pope. You're not good buddies with him. You actually thought that you and the Pope were best buddies. Yeah. Like a few years ago, I thought I need to go to the Vatican. I have this great idea how to help Catholicism and, you know, purify all Catholics and the whole religion. And I really thought that. And at the time, you know, if somebody was telling me, John, that's not true, it'd be like saying, well, that's not water that you're drinking. Yeah, it is. <laughs> you know, you can't convince me otherwise. Or, oh, that's not the air you're breathing. No, you can't convince me otherwise because I'm in it and I believe it. You can't really rationalize with someone who's going through it. But at the same time, Andrew, I have something like a treatment plan written up with my wife and I gave her permission and like my therapist and my doctor that if things get too intense, that that's okay for them to hospitalize me or take further action to help me. But that's a discussion I'm taking now before, you know, I get manic. So we can prepare for that. And I think we'll talk about that later. But there's just a bit more about this impulsivity I want to investigate, because my understanding is that you're a wholesome person with strong values and I think Mm -hmm. religious beliefs. So this impulsivity was actually entirely, completely and utterly out of character and was against everything you believed in it. Am I thinking that correctly with that? Yeah, you're right on target with that. That's exactly true. Like I have specific morals and ethical code that I follow myself. And so this sort of thinking and actions are completely out of the ordinary. It's like I'm a different person. So you've had the mania, which is really up, and then there comes a crash. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. The depression part, you know, I was talking to you earlier about the energy level, you know, in mania, you're, my mind's racing, all these projects. And then with depression, my mind slows down so much and it's hard to do anything, to get any energy, to get out of bed. People don't realize that just functioning during the day, trying to get up and eat or take a shower, or just pick up your stuff, 
it's a huge, overwhelming obstacle to try to do any of that. And not to mention, you know, some people, they get insomnia during that time. I get hypersomnia, so I sleep so much. I just want to lay in bed. I don't have, I just don't want to do anything. I don't want to go out and be around friends or family or go outside, which I love. I love going out into the sun and exercising. And I know things are bad when I don't want to work out or go outside, if that makes sense. Yeah. So were you cooperating when somebody said, I really think you need to see a doctor and get some help? Uh, Yeah. Well, actually, I, I probably should backtrack a little bit before that, because before that actually happened with me kind of losing touch with reality and so forth. When I went off to school at CSU for college, I've always thought that something I was not exactly the same as everybody else. Growing up during my teenage years, the adults in my life said, John, you're just acting like a normal teenager. But I didn't feel, I felt so different. And some of the things that I was feeling with hopelessness and the depression part, and then staying up for days at a time, a lot of my friends weren't experiencing exactly what I was feeling. So when I went off to school, I was searching for answers because I knew something was different, but I didn't know what. And my mom is a Christian scientist. And I don't know if you know much about Christian science. You'll have to explain to me. Okay. Christian science is a religion. They believe that it's mind over matter. So they try not to go see doctors or get medical treatment if they don't have to. And that's how I grew up. So I didn't even really know what a doctor was or a therapist or psychiatrist. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't know much about any of that when I went off to school. So this was all brand new for me and it was a whole nother world. So for me, it was a real big eye opener. It was huge (laughs) in like the best way possible for me though, because then I was able to get help. (laughs) So did you feel guilty because you were going against what your mother believed? Not really, because my dad is a really strong Catholic a devout Catholic. And then my mom, you know, is a Christian scientist. So sounds like a weird combination to me, I'm afraid. Yeah, no, it really was. It really was. Yeah, I could tell you stories about growing up, you know, that's a whole nother conversation. (laughs) And I think this is something that we cannot stress too much. This is something that you should not self-diagnose. Don't read five signs on the internet and either diagnose your partner or yourself. You Mm -hmm. really do need to get a proper diagnosis. So how do you get a proper diagnosis? I went through a couple different diagnoses before it came out as bipolar type one. Like you were saying, so many of these mental illnesses, their symptoms overlap. Like ADHD, they thought I had ADHD at first, but then when I was in the group, they said, wow, we're not up for a week at a time, you know, doing that. Like I I had problems with my mood and energy level similar to ADHD, but it was different. And then when I went into the doctor, that's when she diagnosed me as type one, when she saw me psychotic and, you know, those sort of things. But like you said, a professional has to diagnose you because they're the ones that know all the criteria about what exactly you have. Like I've been diagnosed with ADHD, cyclothymic disorder, borderline personality disorder, which is very similar to bipolar disorder. But when the doctor takes my life as a whole and sees all the little details, then they're able to say, oh, John, actually you don't have borderline or you don't have ADHD, although there's some similar symptoms that overlap, you definitely have bipolar disorder. So diagnosis is really important and also keeping an open mind because the professionals might take a while to get the correct diagnosis. So it feels a little bit like, and this is why I love people like yourself, because it seems like you sort of have to be a team with the medical profession to Mm -hmm. actually get things right. You don't just hand it over to them. You're actually an important part of the care package. Am I right with that? Yeah, definitely. Definitely, Andrew, because 
again, a lot of the points you're talking about, I've spoken with people recently about this. And when it comes to getting care for yourself, you need, like for me, I had to take reins myself. Like I didn't wait for somebody else to say, okay, John, you know, this is what you're experiencing. It's so important to seek out the information yourself. I don't know if you've heard of the term biohacking. No, tell me about biohacking. It <laughs> sounds interesting. Yeah, it's, it's basically where uh, instead of just waiting for somebody else to say, okay, hey, John, try this strategy or this coping mechanism, you know, like meditation or this type of yoga or whatever it is, breathing techniques, I test it out on myself to see how it works. Like when it comes to medication, I work with my doctor for that, of course, medical professional. I definitely don't do any changes without talking to my doctor, but I research different medications. I see which ones, the side effects, and I recommend ideas to my doctor because I think it's so important to find a medical professional that wants to partner with you so they're open to what you want to do because it's your life. It's your quality of life. I mean, some of these meds that I've been on, it's not okay for me to gain 50 pounds to try to make me stable when my life to function each day goes down the tube. So for me, I had to figure out a baseline of stability that I could deal with. And then this whole biohacking idea is I would try out these different strategies on myself. And I used to keep a mood journal and I'd write down each day different things I'd try and how I would feel. And I would do something for a month or two or whatever it was and see if that particular strategy would work. And then if it didn't, would I add something else? Would I take it away? It just depends on how I'm feeling and what I'm doing. So some of the strategies I found didn't work at all. And then when I combine some of them, they work even better than they were by themselves, if that makes sense. So how does a mood journal work? A mood journal is basic. It's just a journal. I call it a mood journal because I have a chart, like a mood chart, where I would chart my moods based on a scale. So if my mood symptoms were more elevated, I would put that on this chart that I have. I actually have it on my website. You can download it for free. I just made one up, but I use that chart. And then I have a separate journal where I write down what happened throughout the day. You know, did I talk to a friend? What did we talk about and how did it make me feel? Did I feel worse? Did it make me feel better? Did I work out? How did that make me feel afterwards beforehand? So with the mood journal, that's another piece that helps with the biohacking because then over time, I started seeing patterns and things that would trigger possible mood episodes. So I could say, oh man, like I have to get at least eight hours of sleep each night and I have to go to bed at the same time and get up at the same time each morning. I have the same night and wake schedule and that helps. And so the journal is basically you write down everything that's going on in your life and how you feel about it. That's the big thing. What are your thoughts? How does it make you feel? How do you react? Does it make you angry? Does it make you sad? You know, do you just feel indifferent? You know, are you exhausted? Are you revved up? Those are things that are important to keep track of. So then over time, you can say, man, I have to stay away from alcohol. Like or maybe I can caffeine. have a drink, you know, or caffeine. Some people it affects that and some it doesn't. So that's why it's so important to write this all down. And it's such a good tool because if you take it into your doctor, you can say, hey, you know, they have like 15 minutes to say, hey, what's going on? If you have your stuff in hand, you can say, this is what I've been doing. This is what's working. This is what isn't. And then they can help you quicker. It kind of makes the whole process faster because it's such a slow one anyways. You have to have so much patience through all this that it, it'll help kind of streamline everything. If you want details of John's website, that will be in the show notes. So let's talk about your daily plan or your weekly plan. What do you make certain you do on a daily and a weekly basis to keep yourself on an even keel? Because I think this is something that the rest of us sort of ignore. We sort of allow ourselves to get our sleep out of kilter. We forget to do exercises and we suddenly start to feel rather, is a non-technical term, shit. 
So I think that all of us could learn from how you put together your daily treatment plan. So give us a a sense of what it is. Okay. Well, you make a good point about how people kind of lax with their sleep schedule and exercise. We always hear from doctors and, you know, all the experts, you need to exercise, you need to eat healthy. And when you have a mental illness or like you said, or normal everyday people that don't, it's going to help you so much to focus on the simple daily activities for survival. Like I make sure I am in bed by nine o'clock each night and I wake up around five or six in the morning. I give myself a little flexibility because my son wakes me up a lot and he's young. He's just turned seven, but I make sure my sleep schedule is like that. I don't do like social media an hour or two beforehand. Or if I do, I make sure to use my glasses that have the blue stuff in it so it doesn't mess up my circadian rhythm. I also make sure in the morning that I work out at least an hour and a half or two each day. And that's huge for me. That's probably the biggest thing for me besides my meds because I take my meds right when I wake up at noon and then at 6.30 at night. And I actually have alarms on my phone that beep right away. So I know when to take them. And if I go anywhere, I have a little pill box where I just put my pills in and I take them with me. I also make sure that I drink water throughout the day, constantly keeping a water bottle like <laughs> like this. I have this right with me right here. <laughs> you know, I, I keep it with me all the time and drink water, lots of it. And then what I do is I'm actually on disability. I'm disabled because of my bipolar disorder. It's really hard for me to maintain a job. Not that I haven't tried throughout the years. So I I think the biggest thing too is eating consistently throughout the day. I try to do breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And I try to have like protein and carbs at each meal. And I try not to snack. I try my best to stay away from sugar. And I don't drink alcohol at all. I used to, but it's not worth it for me. The after effects, I mean, I can feel it for days now. So I don't do that. And caffeine, I keep to a minimum as well. So I think the biggest thing is my meds and exercise. And then I also need downtime a lot throughout the day. I need to take breaks where I'm just kind of by myself. Tell me about the break, because we're not very good at downtime. So explain exactly what downtime is for you. For me, it's just go sit outside on our patio for like 10 or 15 minutes and just breathe and just kind of close my eyes and just, I don't do anything. I don't get on the phone. I try to sit there with my thoughts because I found downtime is so key for me. I mean, even as much as just hanging out with my wife and watching like a TV show or like a movie or something like that. Just something to kind of take back the intensity of our lives every day. I have an afternoon nap every day. Oh, yeah. Oh, see, that's awesome. That's perfect. (laughs) That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Just 10 minutes, but I can't tell you how much difference it makes. And I do become a bit cranky, I have to say, if I haven't had it. But it's very easy to say, oh, I've got to plow on and go through that. But for you, you cannot afford to slack. And this is, you have this wonderful image of yourself being a warrior. So tell me why that image is important to you. For me, it's really empowering because I see a warrior is someone who's not just like strong physically, but mentally too. So I do things that I better myself each day. I try to do things that'll help keep me healthy. And it's empowering to see yourself that for me, at least I know some people, maybe it's not the best way to look at it. But for me, I see bipolar, I call it the bipolar battle, you know, for a reason, it's something I fight each day. But the thing that I think is big looking at this perspective is that I fight the battle of bipolar disorder, but I embrace the journey. So I see my illness is separate from myself. And so these tools that I take each day or I do, for me, it's okay, if I work out for an hour and a half to two, when I eat, you know, in the morning, the afternoon, in the evening, when I take my downtime, that's the way that I fight the battle. Those are the weapons that I use to take it face on, to take my meds. 
I see my therapist once a week on Wednesdays. Uh, you know, that's something I do every week because he helps keep me grounded too, my therapist. And then I see my medical provider, the medication piece on a monthly basis. Does that make sense? <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. What I would like to understand is the difference between the battle and the journey. Tell me about the journey. The journey is more like day to day, just living, trying to deal with it and manage it. Because as an illness, you know, people, when it comes to seeing it as an actual battle, you can separate it from yourself because I don't like to identify myself as, oh, hey, I'm John, I'm bipolar. It's more, I'm John, I live with bipolar disorder. It's something I fight. And then each day, living day to day, that's part of my journey. What can I do to embrace and make myself, my quality of life better? Because when it comes down to it, that's really what I'm trying to do is maintain a sense of stability so I can function from day to day. And I know some people on the outside might look in and say, man, your life is kind of boring. Like you're just, <laughs> you're not doing anything real huge or exciting. But when you have a chronic illness like bipolar disorder, that's kind of the way it is. I don't want to go back to where it was before. It was so chaotic. I mean, I have so many stories, but to me, it's more important to function because I have people counting on me. I have two kids. I have a wife. I can't afford to just let things go. So embracing the journey is doing things that make me feel better so I can cope each day and function. And I think everybody, if you can have an image like that for your life, you know, whether it's on a path, a journey or whatever, and, you know, you might be a magician, you might be a warrior, you might be a sorcerer. It sort of doesn't really matter. What is important is you've sort of got a way of looking at things because life is incredibly complicated. And these kind of images help us organize ourselves and help us make sense of things. So I think that that image might not work for everybody, but it really is important for everybody to have some kind of image of their life. So there's another thing that is important for you. And I think that part of your plan is actually doing the sort of thing that you're doing today. You blog, you write, you help others. That's an important part of your maintenance program, isn't it? Yes, it is. Why is helping others so important? For me, my whole life, I've always enjoyed helping people. If somebody needs something, I'm the first one to be like, hey, how can I help out? What can I do? And I've learned for me personally that it helps increase my quality of life and it gives me more personal fulfillment from just living my life is if I can help someone. And especially with bipolar disorder, you know, it took me 10 years to find the right set of medications that would help allow me to function. And if I can help somebody, you know, take off five years from them trying to experiment on different strategies and so forth, I love that. I love getting emails that say, John, you saved my life. You literally did. You helped me. Now I can live again or I can function or this strategy has helped me lose 60 pounds. And I feel so much better about myself. I have the energy to go through the day. And like you said, for me, blogging and, you know, talking to you or doing a YouTube session or I have a podcast that I do too, all these things, I love being creative in using those outlets to help educate people because empowerment is a big thing. Whether you take the perspective as a warrior or a battle or whatnot, I think anybody living with a mental illness, you need to do things that empower yourself and give you control because a mental illness is so chaotic and it takes away so much of your control. You need to focus on those things that you can. Now, one of the problems of bipolar, and I think it's something that a lot of people are going to recognize, is what you call stinking thinking. Yeah. So first of all, explain what stinking thinking is and how do you deal with it? Mm -hmm. When I was first diagnosed, my therapist used to tell me that all the time. He'd say, if I started getting negative and like, oh man, like catastrophic thinking is, oh, this happened. 
that just ruined my entire day. My entire life. Yeah, my entire life. It's ruined. That's the sort of thing that's stinking thinking. It's like the negative, catastrophic, oh my gosh, it's basically being like over dramatic about how the impact of something is going to affect you personally. So when it comes to stinking thinking, it took me a while to work with my therapist because I did a lot of sessions with him where I would talk and he would help me recognize what stinking thinking was like, okay, John, this happened. It takes practice to tell your mind, no, it's not going to destroy my day, my week, my month, my life. Like this sucks. I hate feeling like this, but let yourself feel the emotion, sit with it. And then, okay, I'm feeling angry, I'm feeling sad, whatever it is, let myself feel it. Because those negative feelings, they suck to deal with, but it helps us move forward if we let ourselves feel them and then move on. Like, accept that you're feeling angry, accept that you're feeling sad, but don't sit with it as well. I would say accept the feelings and challenge the thoughts. So you accept the fact you're angry. And then actually, are you as angry as you say? Is this the worst thing that's ever happened or just a really shitty thing that's happened? Yeah. And I think it really is useful to be able to spot when your mind is going from just sort of, oh, I wonder what I'm going to have for tea type of thinking into, oh, I'm never going to be able to afford to boom, boom, boom. I'm never going to find a wife. I'm never going to have children and all those other things like that. Yes, exactly. So you also have a crisis plan as well. Mm -hmm. So that if things get out of kilter, Mm -hmm. something kicks in. So tell me about your crisis plan. It's actually what I kind of alluded to earlier when we were talking about if I ever get to the point where I'm manic and I lose control my wife or my therapist or my doctor, they can step in and I've given them permission to contact a hospital. I also, if I get manic or I start to feel myself going towards that, I have PRN meds, as needed meds that I keep on hand that help me sleep extra and they help calm my mind. And I only take them though, if I feel like I'm starting to get revved up. And I'm at the point now in my life where with that mood journal, it helped so much in working through therapy that I'm very self-aware of where I'm at. So I can make those decisions like, oh, gosh, I'm starting to feel this way and I know I'm heading that way. So I need to do something now. At the beginning, of course, if you're first diagnosed, you know, you're younger, it's more difficult to pinpoint those triggers and those feelings and, you know, what's situational and so forth. But I have those PRN meds, you know, I've talked with those closest to me that they can step in and that's okay. Even if I get upset, like, hey, that's okay. You know, like uh, down the road, I'll, you know, I, I agreed to it. So it's kind of what will happen if I get to that point. I don't really have one for depression because, It's not to the point where I'm out of control, where I'm psychotic and delusional. At least I've never felt that way when I'm depressed. So it doesn't really impact me. And how long is it since the last time you had a manic phase? Back in 2016, it was right at the end of the summer. It was like August, September. And stress is a big thing for me a big trigger. And I know it is with a lot of people just going through life, (laughs) you know, it can deregulate how you're feeling and so forth. But at that point, there was legal stuff that was happening with my ex-wife and custody with my kiddos, you know, work and all these things kind of came together. That's when I started thinking that I was friends with the Pope. And my sort of manias are very faith-based which means that they have a lot to do with God and having a lot of power and being uh, sort of supernatural and demons and so forth. Because I, at that time, we were going back to South Carolina. I was flying on a plane. And at the time, I thought the devil was there. And my wife had to keep me calm. It just got worse and worse because my doctor said, John, you can go out on the trip. But it just got worse and worse to the point where we had to come back early. And then I went right into the hospital basically from there. But since then, I've been good or I've been well. How do you cope with being a parent? Because I'm 
sorry, but children and stress go together a bit like a horse and carriage. Don't they? <laughs> yes, they do. They do. I, I tell you, Andrew, it's trying to find the balance with my kids because I have a daughter with my ex-wife and then I'm remarried and I have a son and we actually homeschool him right now. And my wife and I help each other. She's really good at helping me maintain because I do get impatient and irritated pretty easy when it comes to little things over and over again. So she can step in. She helps with that. So it's not just me shouldering it all myself. If I didn't have her, you know, she's instrumental in my support with that each day. That's how I cope. <laughs> and this is quite shocking, but you never expected to reach your 30th birthday, did you? I didn't. Uh -uh. I, I really didn't. You know, I told you that it took me about 10 years. That was right at the mark where I found some meds that worked. And at that point, I had a, a number of suicide attempts that, you know, luckily they didn't kill me. I remember having a discussion with my buddy and he said, promise me you won't kill yourself. And he was going through similar stuff too. And he promised me as well. And I actually lost him. He was my best buddy from college. And at that point, that's when I was like, you know, that's kind of it. But then my daughter was born. And at that point, it wasn't just me. You know, it wasn't just about me and my illness. I'm bringing another a kiddo into this life. And so I had something more to live for at that time because I really didn't think I was going to make it because trying to deal with such a chaotic illness just for, you know, a few months or a year is hard enough. But when you don't see any hope or light down the tunnel and people were always trying to tell me that they would always be like, oh, John, it'll get better. But year after year, it just seemed like it was getting worse and worse. And I was losing hope. But around that time, you know, I found it and it was just that little bit, but it got me through. So that's why, you know, when I say that I didn't think I would, I really didn't because I was at that point where I didn't know how I'd be able to go on because of how hopeless I felt and just how, you know, the ups, the downs, the manias, the depressions. At one point, I didn't even know if I was going to be able to live independently by myself and I was like, man, this life, uh, this is the way life is. This is the way it's going to be for me. It felt dismal, but, you know, I've come a long way since then. <laughs> and how old are you now? I am 42. 42. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. But I think we really do have to underline how important the daily care is. Mm -hmm. And you are an extreme example of going off the rails, but we all, without daily care, are not at our best. And if we're not careful, it just gets worse and worse. And we tend to try and push on through. And that's the worst thing you can do. So thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah, definitely. My pleasure. <laughs> the Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. So one of the great advantages of becoming a supporter of The Meaningful Life is you get a chance to write in with a letter and myself and my guest talk about it together. And this is the letter that we're going to talk about. I often feel overwhelmed and everything rests on my shoulders. I have a wife and a child and I'm solely responsible for putting a roof over their heads and paying the bills. I run my own business, which is okay, but ever so often, everything will become too much at home or at work and I will flip and explode. The worst part of it is that nobody really understands. I try to be a good man, but I feel I am disappointing everybody yet again. I can't make my wife happy. I truly do my best. Think about everything ahead of time, keep the kitchen clean, take out the garbage, collect her from her mother's so she doesn't have to go on the bus with the buggy. But then we have a terrible row because I lose it over something small and it all turns to ashes in my mouth. She cries, which I simply can't stand, and I feel the pressure building up again. I wonder what's wrong with me. Why can't I be happy when I have everything? I told myself I would buy my own house before I hit 30, and I've done that. 
I read stuff on the internet about anger issues and up pops all this stuff about ADHD, obsessive compulsive order, PTSD and depression, and you name it. Anything in that letter particularly resonate with you, John? It does. I have a few thoughts about it. First of all, with the anger part, when I was growing up, I viewed anger as a bad thing, as a bad emotion. But the reality is, it's something that we all feel, and it's how we handle it that's so important, what helps the most. And so with anger, I think it's important to realize for the gentleman that wrote in that it's not something that you should feel bad about feeling that because we all do. And I think it's perceived as such a bad thing. The thing is, in terms of feeling like, oh, well, I have everything and I should feel happy. Those are expectations. I've spoken a lot about expectations because, you know, dealing with an illness or anything, you have all these expectations. Like he was saying, you know, as a man, I need to do this. As a man, I need to provide, I need to do X, Y, and Z with taking care of my wife and the house and so forth. But those expectations, they hinder us if we make them... Our rulers. Yeah. You know, that make them the general of our life if we stay with the battle. The generals don't know best. They're way behind the lines, sending orders off. And, you know, we don't have to listen to them all the time. Yes, I love that. I love that, Andrew, because you can you can drive yourself crazy with expectations. You can feel so much disappointment and feel so bad about yourself, like in this instance, like, oh, before 30, I wanted to have a house. And that's awesome that he did that. I think that's fantastic. But at the same time, don't just say, well, if I get this or do that, that should make me happy. You asked me, Andrew, earlier about helping other people. That gives me personal fulfillment. I think each of us needs to find what fulfills us, what does make us happy, what makes you get out of bed each day. What I would say is this idea of you suddenly losing it over something small. I wonder if this has been building up for quite a while and you have been ignoring the signs that you're getting more and more angry because, you know, you're Mr. Nice and you're Mr. Good Man. And so you can't say, well, actually, I haven't got time to collect you from your mother's. And I'm sure your wife doesn't really mind that much going on the bus, et cetera, et cetera. So that you're actually pushing yourself so hard. And there's so much that you should have talked about earlier that is building up. This is why the explosions happen. And back to John's mood diary, I would be really interested about you keeping an anger diary. You know, what is actually going on when this anger is building up? What are the patterns? You know, are you getting, as John is saying, are you getting enough sleep? Are you pushing yourself too much? You know, is the alcohol concerned with all of this? Because I think that if you understand yourself better and you also question whether you should be doing all these things. The word should should be banned. Oh dear, I've used it myself. I was going to say the word should should be banned from the English <laughs> language. It would be rather nice if we did away with the term should. There we are. Because we drive ourselves mad with the shoulds of this world. You know, who says? Most probably your father or your mother or some school teacher, and they can live their lives and you and your wife can lead your life. If you are concerned about the anger issues, get some help. If you think you really do have some kind of disorder, speak to your doctor about it and get a proper diagnosis. So I think that if you get a better handle on anger, and it is not the enemy, it is instead a perfectly normal human emotion, I think that you will be in a much better place. I hope that was helpful for you. So. John, I've invited you on The Meaningful Life to discuss and be a witness for what makes life meaningful. So what makes your life meaningful? For me, Andrew, like I mentioned, helping people brings me the most fulfillment in the world. Just knowing that I've had an impact so other people can deal with their bipolar disorder. That's my primary focus is that. But like you said, a lot of these strategies, they will help anybody, whether you have a mental illness or not. They're practical strategies. And I love showing people 
how it helps me. And not to mention my family. My family, they're just huge in my life. They bring me happiness and fulfillment. They make life worth going and moving forward. And it's really basic for me, but that's what makes life worth living for me. <laughs> what do you think your wife would say about living with somebody with bipolar? Is it a battle for her too? I'm sure she would say something similar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because, you know, yeah, but she's such a good support. Andrew, she's awesome. I mean, she's very understanding and patient with me. And I think that says a lot too about how she is as a person and why we're able to mesh so well, you know? Well, thank you very much for being my witness on The Meaningful Life. This is where we say goodbye to most of our listeners. But if you'd like to become a supporter of this project to help understand what makes life meaningful and help people lead a more meaningful life, you can find out details about how to become a supporter in a moment and unlock all sorts of useful benefits like the three things that John knows to be true. And we'll be talking about that in our supporters circle. But for the time being, John, thank you very much for being my guest. Thank you for having me, Andrew. It was such a pleasure chatting with you. <laughs> You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.